Hey, I'm Aaron. I'm one of the founders of Deliver That. I'm John, other co-founder of Deliver That. Welcome to the Founder Series. Founders for life. <laughs> You like that, right? Founders. <laughs> I, I did like that. Um, <laughs> gentlemen, our topics today, um, we're going to start out um, with how we found our niche as a delivery service company. Uh, it's kind of a broad topic. We don't have to... Sp- we're getting right into it, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to get nitty and gritty here. I want to start out hot, see something, if we can bring some value to people out there starting to starting their own businesses. Um, and I think, obviously, we have a very specific yeah. niche here. And what we do so um maybe you know how how we came about how we got started and then how you pivot and and find something that we stuck to since since that time got awesome um before we even get into the question though i think john maybe you and i can take a couple seconds to talk to our to the 10 people listening to this podcast right now um (laughs) hopefully it's a lot more downplay i'm just i'm being humble okay it's 10 (laughs) And hopefully in the future, it's significantly more. But uh, I think if you and I give a little bit of our backstory Mm -hmm. on not so much about, I mean, you can look at the other podcasts we've done or stories and videos we've done about our story, but let's talk about, um, you know, I guess going from zero to, you know, in 2024, we might do 25 million in revenue this Mm -hmm. year. It's a very profitable business. Mm -hmm. Um, We've got close to, I think, 70 full-time employees here, 30,000 contracted drivers. And that all started with an idea that you and I had in college, right? Yep. So yep. I think, I like it. Um, you know, we're not just two, two guys that haven't walked the walk or done this. We, this, we've fact, in, in fact, we've never had a real job, right? We've been doing this since we've been 19 years old. Yep. So I think, I don't think, I know over the last 11 years of being a founder and navigating COVID, ups and downs of fundraising, handling employees, customers. I mean, heck, I, did, I wanted to be a doctor when I was in college. I didn't <laughs> want to be in business. Mm-hmm. So you're yep. you're 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 hearing from two individuals that have that are scrappy that to their core are entrepreneurs. I think that's very important to just to call out. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I mean, 2013, this whole thing started. Yeah, I think we incorporated our business like on December 6th of 2013. Yep, overpaid that lawyer. I remember that. Oh yeah, I mean that guy. Oh, yeah. Another thing, guys. I remember that. I mean, I'll never first, forget that. First time founders, right? Just no, I appreciate it. I think, that, I think that was like very valuable in, in explaining you. why you're here and, and what we're doing here. Kids. Um oh, yeah. We'll get into all that stuff. Yeah. But uh, ben, something I think would be interesting for to talk in there. about. I wanted to just give a little bit of our Initially in 2013, say, we're not I think like schmucks, DoorDash right? is kind of really just <laughs> beginning. They're probably in like some major cities, not really smaller markets that they are nowadays. But in a market that ends up becoming very crowded fairly quickly, how do you find an opportunity for a new innovation um, or, or find your place in a market like that where there's already major, major players in that space. You know, I mean, then there wasn't. I don't think we even, I don't even, I didn't even know of any other delivery companies doing deliveries on college campuses besides like, I don't even, I, I never heard of DoorDash no, at the time. There was no, besides, there was nothing. I think there was like Bite Squad. There was like, there was smaller ones. There was like, uh, but they weren't really in Ohio. No. So they weren't. Nope. There was no worry on our end if, uh, we were going to be really competing with anyone. It was just, are people going to pay to get stuff yeah. delivered? Yeah, and I think if that's you, what it was. If you look at back who we were really competing with, it was mm-hmm. like the restaurants in the area, like the pizza yep. places that would do delivery, yep. or like Jimmy John's. They did their own self delivery. So yep. it's like that. That was our competition. And yep. it, again, you know, if you're a consumer and you didn't want to order from the three different options that delivered you food, yep. we opened up Pandora's box of opportunity of like whether you wanted a chipotle burrito you wanted your textbook delivered to your classroom homework yep. convenience item groceries like we did everything i mean so, we just said we would deliver chipotle and that was it just lined up man that i think Ch- i think chipotle by the way this is how old i am okay when when we were in school chipotle you could get a double wrapped double rice <laughs> double meat burrito for less than seven dollars it what was is- the best value anywhere because i would always compare okay can i have one and a half meals for yeah, seven the john bucks? zeno scale was always it was always everything you go get a, go to a fine diet you go to ruth's chris steakhouse compare it to chipotle every time <laughs> that might be a stretch maybe, now he's mr steak not. now maybe not <laughs> no but like yeah that no i think you you always you would always derive you know 
um, come to your conclusions about if something was worth it or not based at least food wise. If it was and like, like if it's in the same category. Yeah, if it was right? like if it compared to Chipotle, if you're yeah. getting seven bucks and you're full, right? That, that, yeah. that was another thing. Is like I'm not oh, paying yeah. seven bucks and not gonna be full. Yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but no, yeah. So Ben, we uh, you know, when we start first started this, we really didn't have any competition, man. Not that I can remember. Um, it was just, you know, like you said, there were others doing it other campuses potentially. Mm-hmm. I didn't really look. I just knew we were only worried about OU. Um, but for us, the market that we were in was wide open. And you can think about, like I talked about earlier, when we first started it, the competitive advantage we had was we could allow a student to get delivery from anywhere, not just the few locations that would do delivery. Mm-hmm. I think there was another place in, at, at OU called DP Doe that would do delivery, yeah, they right? Would. They would deliver, like, cow zones and stuff. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. Now, okay, so that was 2013. Mm-hmm. Things start to progress, right yeah 2014 2015 and and we graduated in 16 yeah okay Mm -hmm. so right up high about you know going into 2015 i remember starting to hear more about different college delivery services Mm -hmm. it started really heating up and at that time none of them made their way to ou yeah where we went to ohio university for everyone not oklahoma Mm -hmm. all right so we went to athens ohio Mm -hmm. go bobcats (laughs) uh so yeah it started heating up then and at that point again we're thinking to ourselves well, we're just trying to have a delivery business here that makes some money that pays for school. Mm-hmm. And like, we really didn't even think about Ben, like the niche topic here, man, until post-graduation. Um, and yeah. then, cause the places we would go, there wasn't competition. It was just, can you execute? Nothing. Can you get customers? Cause you knew it was going to work cause it worked at OU. So the same, yeah, and like, same caliber of people is at every other campus. I remember, so. you know, people would be like, Oh, you're like, uh, you know, some sort of you know online ordering technology like i like yelp had one for a little bit like mm-hmm. e24 or something it's yep. like no we that's not who we compete with like mm-hmm. we're, we're not you can't order food from us directly yep. right like we weren't like sinking into a pos or like menu man like menu management or anything it was we would if you would place an order we would go be it's like a typical courier model we'd mm-hmm. go get your food for you yeah um so it's like we didn't really have any competitors until um like i said we started to graduate and yeah. then ben I know you're going to chime in here, but like the niche thing really came alive when we tried to get our on-demand business model here mm. in Canton, Ohio. Yeah. And that's where, hey, we can't compete with the DoorDashes. We can't compete with you, Reach the World, the people that are well-funded. They have incredible technology. Their app, you know, killed ours. Our app didn't even work half the time. I remember even just thinking about our, our skills, you and I. I remember since we went, you know, viral – that we, I thought we were marketing experts. We're like, we know how to talk to, you know, our generation. And then you come back here to Canton, Ohio, and you just get slapped in the face. You see that? You see that mascot over there? Oh, ben, man. you might want to might want to just cue to that one eventually, oh, yeah. right, on the back yeah. end here. See that mascot? Um, there's a video of me running around on Dayton's campus with that thing. Oh, yeah. That's the John Zeno. That's to, the John Zeno marketing plan right there. And proceeding to get kicked off that campus. Immediately. We were allowed to do I think that. we I think at the time we had like a budget of like ten thousand dollars post college to like start our business here, yep. like get it going. I think we spent five on that on that mascot. <laughs> Great ROI. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. It was, ter- it was terrible. <laughs> cool looking logo though. Yeah. Great, great looking logo. Mm-hmm. But um <laughs> Yeah, John, let's let's take uh, let's take the people into our into our life, you know, twenty sixteen. Yeah. Okay. So you and I just graduated school. I was in Los Angeles for a couple months during the summertime. Yep. I okay. was painting. Yeah, you're painting. Mm. Yeah. Terrible. Man, I hate painting. Same. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So I come back. That'll make you work hard. I come back mm-hmm. from from LA. Yep. Freshly off losing Probably. thirty pounds. By the way, I got like the best shape of my life out there. August. Yeah. You're back. I had, I had the the LA fade. Oh yeah, I talked about that for a long time. Yep. <laughs> So I was like, I was like a different person at that point. Yeah. And uh, I remember we tried to get this, this, our deli- on-demand delivery business here in Canton, Ohio. Yep. And like, you just couldn't do it. And so we went into a restaurant in the area. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's in here anymore. It's not here anymore. Nope. Um, and, and we, we go t- to Ruby Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. With Ruby Tuesday. Right. Great brand. Yep. Love their food. Great salad bar. Oh, it's croutons. Yeah. Oh yeah. Soaked in Man. something. <laughs> oil uh, <laughs> but uh we went in there and i still talked to the gm that we first pitched well Paul. we walk in in you know khaki shorts because we were in fraternity khaki shorts polo basically what I'm and wearing, basically what i'm wearing right now and sperry's because we thought they were they were professional he claims 
that manager claims you're walking in in flip flops. I was like, well, I've never worn flip flops. <laughs> he definitely life. embellishes the story a little bit <laughs> so when he talks about not, it. That's it's not like we truth. didn't look like we were like two two homeless dudes. Like, yeah, you know, we look like a couple guys that just got off a boat, like yeah. a, like a boat, like like a frat party. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we look like. Yeah, basically. And <laughs> uh, and we pitch him and two of his other uh, managers, at least two. There was a definitely a few of them and only a couple of us. And uh, he said, you know, we'll do your on demand stuff. Um, you know, we're not going to turn down if you're going to give us free orders, we'll take it. But I have these catering orders that are just along the side of the, uh, the wall over there that none of my servers want to take because they're always during the lunch rush when they make their tips, they make their money during the lunch rush. They don't want to go take catering orders, drive their own car, pay for gas, all that type of stuff. So we took one. I wait, wait, let's, let's rewind here real quick. Hey. <laughs> John didn't want to do the the OU deliver the campus delivery. Yeah. What did you What did you say when we were first going on, on this route? Like, well, I watched some of our dr- drivers struggle to pick up, you know, a burrito or two. So I could only imagine the difficulty in picking up three hundred dollars. Long story short, John <laughs> said he didn't want to do this. All right, <laughs> again, two times now. I think that's the filter for a good idea. Yeah, if John doesn't want to do it, you want it. You, you, yeah, you're <laughs> bullish on that idea. Yeah. All right, yeah, hesitant if I want to do it. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I remember, yeah, we were saying, let's try it, man, let's try it. And right there, Ben, we took the first catering order for, at the time, it was... I think it, it was just the next day. It was Deliver That. It wasn't OU Delivery or Campus Delivery this time. It was Deliver That. Yep. And, uh, yeah, we, we changed that name, what, 2016? Right when we got out of college. Yeah, May yeah. or yep. April. We, were, we went from OU, like Ohio University Delivery, to Campus Delivery. We'd, we went to Campus Delivery because we started launching new schools, yeah. right, Kent State, Ohio State. Yep. And then we went to Deliver That because at the time we were trying to raise money to build an application, yep, which we ended up giving away equity in our company. It was a terrible decision. We yeah. got it back though. No, we yeah, back. we, we just bought it back. We didn't know how to how to speak the language of building, yeah. No, we got again. Tech. Founders, you know, rule number one here: you're gonna if you're a young first time founder, people are gonna try and take advantage of you at every yep. single step. Get some people in Get, your corner that can speak the languages of law. Yeah, you know. All types of different accounting, things. money. If you're, if you're in technology, tech. man, you got to have someone, a principal in your business that is super focused on technology. And you don't have to be able to do it all, but you have to have people in your network that can that you can yeah. trust because you can't just call up a lawyer. Hey, help me. Yeah, that, that, it's just they don't work. You got to be careful. But anyways, back to the niche thing. We take this delivery, okay? We take, we load it up on our car. The guy says, "Hey, next time, you know where?" I think we. You said we took the delivery the next day, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. So, yeah, he's like, come come back tomorrow, wear slacks, mm-hmm. wear nice shoes, Yep. you know, look like you're going into a boardroom, and, uh, you know, dress the part. He's mm-hmm. like, when you get there, set the food up like this. You want you don't just throw it on the table, you know. You get a signed receipt, you have, you know, be nice and polite. And so we did that. We took that delivery from that, that Ruby Tuesday about 10 miles away, set it up real nice. People were happy. We were bringing them lunch. You know, it was like to yeah, a, everyone's face lights up when you walk as like a medical facility. Yep. And uh, right after we get, you know, I'm having the person sign the, you know, whatever, sign the receipt and they leave us a, like a 30 or 40 hour tip. Yep. I remember looking at John and be like, dude, we can do this. Yep. And Ben, that was when another light bulb, I got like 25 light bulbs up here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There were the, quite a bit. Yeah. There's a lot of light bulbs. Yep. One light bulb goes out like, dude, we're not doing on demand anymore. We're not doing business, you know, cons- you know, we're not doing deliveries to consumers. Yep. We're going to go partner with restaurants who cannot staff drivers to mm-hmm. do their catering orders. We didn't need to build tech. No. Initially. Nope. All you had to do was show up when you said you're going to show up. Yep. Do a good job. Didn't he be great? Just, just good. Just do a didn't good have to be job, incredible. You right? Know? You can mess up. You can make mistakes, but just... If you're actually trying and you actually show up and the food gets there, you check most of the boxes, Mm -hmm. right? And that's what we learned pretty quickly. And again, Ben, at the time, like we're juggling, like how do we get this on demand stuff here in, you know, Canton, Ohio, when you've got DoorDash and Uber Eats or, you know, they're doing everything besides, you know, they're getting orders from consumers. They're taking the deliveries from restaurants. They're handling the different, you know, different things. And then there's us with nothing. So like finding your niche in a market that's crowded, it, it, it'll make or break your business. Yeah. Like entirely. Yeah. We would not be here right now if we did not find this catering niche in the yeah. delivery business. And I think you end up just finding what works just by being consistent and putting in the effort. You know, it took us three, 
maybe even four years almost to find catering, right? Three years to find catering. We could have just kept going. Could have said, we don't want to do catering. I, I want to keep, you know, we've made money this other way. Let's stay with the other way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think if you have an idea, you can't just be married to the idea. You have to be able to. You gotta be able to pivot, dude. You have to be able to pivot. You know, you know as we we take it easy. <laughs> take it easy. It's like the fourth time he's done that. <laughs> you know, we've been talking to other founders lately, and uh, that to me is the main thing: is that you might not even be correct. Yes, your idea sounds great, but you might not be correct the first time. But if you're willing to give up on that idea and follow whatever your customers are saying then you could be successful and for my more uh and ben, i know you keep you pulling the mic i don't know if you want to chime in now but i have one more thing i want to talk about Go. because you know there are going to be founders that listen to this that say like well i'm you know i'm going to school to be a founder or i'm you know I'm, i've always wanted to be a founder like we didn't always want to be a founder okay so you're going to have to use a there's a there's a term total addressable market tam people call it okay Understanding your total addressable market in any business you go in is critical. It's something that we never did for the longest time. Mm-hmm. And when you look at an entire market, it's, like it's, it's like a pie, right? Okay, you got one big pie. Say that you wanted this is the delivery industry. Well, that pie is broken up into certain slices. Some could be, you know, grocery delivery. Some could be mealtime or on-demand delivery, catering delivery. Packages. Packages. Yeah. It, it all falls under, like, delivery, right? Mm-hmm. And then each of those pieces – of that market gets sliced up with who owns the market share, right? So if you if you look at the pie, right, everyone, like the food delivery pie, everybody wanted that mealtime order that Ben Alcar ordering off DoorDash to get, you know, 40 bucks worth of Taco Bell. No, I'm <laughs> shaking his head. Taco Bell, yes. Okay. Everybody, every big player wanted that customer. They, they wanted that customer to order off their app yep. five, six, seven times a month, okay? Yep. We could not compete in that market. That's the bigger slice of the pie, but there was this little sliver, right, which was catering delivery. <laughs> yeah, it was. And we started to attack that where no yep. one else wanted it. Well, and it made so much sense because restaurants, I think the average restaurant's bringing in a couple, couple grand, five grand a day mm-hmm. revenue. Average catering order is three, three fifty. If you do a few of those a day, you could double, 30%, whatever, increase your revenue pretty quickly. Um, and by only having to fulfill one customer in your restaurant instead of 30 or 50 or 100. Try, try and compare this to a different industry because not everyone's going to be in the food industry that's listening to this. Like, how, you're in real estate now, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you're doing, a lot, yep. you're doing a lot of commercial real estate. Yep. Like, you're not in the day-to-day of this business anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, try and compare this on what you see on the real estate side to compare to, like, how we carved out our niche. Um, like, 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 what specifically are you guys doing in Cleveland right now? in your niche for real estate? You know, I, I think it's uh, it's really unique and they're focusing on, really we're focusing on specific types of homes that are a little less risky when it comes to the overall fluctuation of the market. Um, but, you know, those homes are from 150 grand to 300 grand first time home buyers, right? It gives you a little more, uh, a little more trust that if the price moves 10%, from a $300,000 home versus a million dollar home, a little bit different. Um, and those fluctuations on a first time home buyer, when the first time home buyer is comparing renting versus owning compared to maybe someone buying their third home, a little bit different. Um, but when you talk about relating it, uh, you know, Kate, how restaurants treat catering, um, compared to a normal single order, I think it would be buying single family homes versus buying, you know, entire apartment complexes right you got retail pricing at wholesale volume and that's exactly what we saw in the restaurants and that's really why we attacked it i'm gonna i'm gonna toot his horn here because i think what he's doing in cleveland is incredible and if you look at what he just talked about right there's that big pie there's that real estate market in cleveland he's carving out a specific piece of that pie for him and his team to go attack Mm -hmm. he learned that from what we did here it wasn't like you went to school or a class on that, did you? Nope. Like, that's a principle that's been instilled in you yep. from us building a business. Like, our team could easily go and work on half a million dollar homes, million dollar homes. But if we catch it at the wrong time and rates go up or prices drop, then there's a lot more risk. So I've learned so much more about risk from this business. And mm-hmm. you don't have to put everything on the line every day. Absolutely. Right. 
Absolutely. Um, if we if we could bounce back a little bit, um, I know some things that were said early on, maybe like even by your dad, maybe John or something like that. But like, what college kid is going to pay for food to get delivered and things oh, like that? that. I know that's a Mr. Know, Hoffman right there. Oh, is that okay? So maybe oh, yeah. Aaron's dad. Um, he still makes fun of me for that, by the way. <laughs> um, oh yeah. So something obviously you have to be concerned about at the beginning of business is who your co- customer is going to be, who's yep. going to consume the product you're you're selling. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Like how important is that when you're when you're trying to carve out a niche? Or were were you guys concerned about college kids paying for food delivery? Were you concerned about restaurants paying for the delivery service? Um, what what were you thinking when it came to a customer in this kind of niche? Well, again, if you look at the like our entrepreneurial journey as like <clears throat> before we graduated and then after, I think you're you're talking to two different people here. Like we're, yeah, like we were just, com- we're completely different now than what we, th- yeah. what we think about things compared to what we did in college. Yeah. In college, it was pretty simple. I think we charged like a three or $4 delivery fee. Yes. And yes. it's like you, everyone was just, we didn't do any surveys or like qualify that anyway. We just mm-hmm. knew like as college kids, like we were the consumer. Yep. Like we knew like what we would pay and we just said, okay, we'll just give that to everybody else. Yep. But now when you talk about like knowing your consumer, it is so important. Um, and I think for any business, knowing, you know, what you're building, whether it's the product or service you're providing mm-hmm. to your customer, um, not only do you need to know that customer profile, you need to be regularly talking to them and getting their feedback because you can't make your product or service any better, yep. bring more value to that consumer unless you know what they want or like what they need. Yeah, spot on. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, so I mean – Again, going to kind of go back to the delivery business now, okay? When we first found out catering, the niche of catering, we didn't know what catering was. We didn't know what customer, like, which restaurants catered or didn't cater, Mm -hmm. right? And we got this bright idea to help a restaurant in Cleveland, Ohio, deliver food Mm. to, like, 17 different states. Mm. We would go to Detroit. We would go to Columbus. We'd go to Pittsburgh. We'd go to— From Cleveland. From Cleveland. New York. We'd go to, you know, from literally from Cleveland. The guy would be pumping out food. Yep. We had we might have had twenty or thirty drivers this month at this point. Yep. And we're just doing at this point we're just doing catering delivery. Mm-hmm. And like we thought this was a great customer for us. Yep. And it I turned, mean it did did learn a lot. Learned a lot. Learned a lot about how to uh, collect money as well. <laughs> right. When you're down your last two thousand dollars and you got you know you got ten grand owed to you. You know. Yeah, you got to pay the drivers five. Yeah. It's that's it, the sweat starts coming down. Yeah. Right. But, uh, you know, at the time, we just we looked at catering as, like, we just want to take any orders that are, that are out there. We didn't know the customer, which was, our, which was the restaurant partner, right, which is the restaurant that was trying to use our fleet of drivers to take these deliveries. I think if we would have had a better idea on the catering business and, like, the customer, we would have gone so much faster. Yeah, oh, yeah. Because we spent a year or two trying to understand how to service the catering business. And a lot of it, for me, was proving to myself that we were correct, we would continue to reinforce that people did want to do catering, people cared, that we were right, because we just pivoted the whole business yeah, yeah. after spending our whole entire college building this business. And I was still trying to, every day you wake up and you haven't made much money yet, you're just still unsure if you're correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we would get reinforcement every step of the way. You'd meet with a restaurant, and I'd call Aaron, and I'd dude this restaurant said this they they, oh, yeah. they care about catering so much they have all these drivers they don't want to do the drivers and it's too tough and we are solving a problem and it took us a long time to like really get into the idea of like talking to our customers hearing from them what mattered to them yeah. what price point do they need to be at yeah right like what did they care about mm-hmm. when it came to the service it was not just what we thought where what value are we going to bring because if you bring value you'll get it back usually in the form of money right So it's like, are we bringing value to these restaurants? What is the problem that we need to solve? And I think, you know, one of the easiest ways to get your foot in the door in any sort of product or service is have competitive pricing, right? If you, like, look at what we did for on-demand delivery. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the best technology. We didn't have a great, we didn't have a driver app. We didn't have a consumer-facing mobile app. We had, like, a website you could order off of. Yeah, we had that web app, but that was Yeah, but it was was terrible. Mm -hmm. Um. But, like, we got our foot in the door with consumers to try us because we offered the cheapest delivery rates. So, yeah. like, price is going to be the easiest way to get your foot in the door. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, you got to look at your customer profile, right? Again, talk to them what matters to them. 
Um, sometimes price doesn't matter at all. Typically, it does mm -hmm. from what we've seen in our businesses, man, what yeah. we've done. Mm -hmm. Price has always been a factor. Yep. But, um, you know, quality is, is, is typically second right, right under that, yeah. um, especially when it comes to delivery. Yeah. Can you execute? Mm -hmm. Any closing statements on, on you know, on how people can navigate that 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 market? I know you know we had to pivot in terms of on demand to catering. Is there? I, I mean, I guess like in you my can, brain, I, what, you guys were very open to the opportunity of pivoting. So do you think that was a crucial part and that plays in the realm that you're now in? Yeah, I, we were always just we wanted to do whatever it took to get to win. Right. So if that meant swallowing your pride and admitting that you were wrong with the on-demand delivery or you were wrong with this sales approach or whatever, that was something we've always had um, where we just didn't really care about the ego, which that never really got in the way, which was incredible. Um, so we were really just willing to do whatever it took just to make this thing work. Yeah, I would say as, a, as an entrepreneur or a founder, you've got to be willing to quickly until you have your you know even, i still even now we're, we're i still changing. don't feel i still don't feel comfortable even with a, a business the size of ours right no, now right now now you feel like now you want to make sure you don't lose it so yeah how do we really insulate? it's like if you don't if, if you don't adapt to like change or be open-minded and you're closed-minded mm -hmm. man your your competition whether you have what you think so or not your competition is going to come and eat your lunch man yeah because if you're winning right now they just want to take you down yeah they're just i mean mm -hmm. so you've got to have an open mind you got to be willing to pivot and you got to be what John said, like, no ego, mm -hmm. right? If you have an ego as an entrepreneur, you're going to fail. I mean, you and I both stepped down. I stepped down as president. You stepped down as CEO. You just had to do has what to, was it, right it for It has the to happen. I mean, we, we've, we've pivoted the business now two or three different times. We went from on-demand to catering, catering to, like, tech-enabled service. Now we're getting, getting into the more of a SaaS model. Yep. It's like a like software, you know, business, building, yep. you know, real enterprise restaurant software mm -hmm. um, to help brands really – really manage their deliveries the right way mm -hmm. um it's like i think everything we've done we were we were correct then yeah but you might not be correct now things change the markets change consumers get used to delivery so now they want it cheaper because it's not as novel as it was um but at the same time you know we're, we're talking about you know you gotta be open-minded like at the same time you cannot just be you can't just forever throw everything at the board see what sticks right you gotta yeah. find your hedgehog yep you got to find out what you're really, really good at and go all in on it. Maybe that's, again, we knew that in the TAM, when we looked at the TAM, right, it's like we were going to be, we could compete in the catering area. Well, let's go all in and be the best catering delivery business out there. That's what we did, okay? Yep. And then we realized now it's like, okay, well, there's software that can't, that might do, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there for, you know, for restaurants when it comes to delivery management. We know exactly what to do. That's what we're building software now, um, you know, for these restaurants because yep. we know the value. We've talked to the consumer which is the restaurant. Like mm -hmm. they're voicing this to us. So yeah, yeah to there is a fine line between just pivoting, you know, every week line, yeah. versus, you know, being right for a while, but realizing that, Hey, it's time to uh, invest back into the business or adjust a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think we're good. I think if, is there any way you guys want to like close the shows out? Like, or, um, no, I mean that's honestly, man. This has been a a great topic. It's mm -hmm. very important for for brands, not brands, for for founders, um, to definitely understand what you know their customer wants and what they need, um, and then to uh, just to go all in on that. But again, don't be don't be afraid of change. Mm -hmm. So that's the I would say that's the the piece I'd leave with the people listening. Yeah, yeah, I think. Uh what helped me a lot going through this whole process because we never knew if we were correct was trying to find validation and how we were doing things through other business owners and podcasts and videos and different things. So um, that's why we're talking here. We want to help other entrepreneurs along their journey. Amen.